This is the second part of the third lecture series for research methods on measurement and validity. The goal of this mini lecture is to help you identify basic threats to research validity that come directly from issues of measurement validity and actually understand what the concept of measurement validity is all about. So we've been talking in the past few lectures about these various steps in the measurement process and the third step after we've actually identified our theoretical constructs and chosen the actual indicators or variables we're going to use to measure that construct, it is now time to assess measurement reliability and validity. Now, if we go back to the, con the diagram of our theoretical system, what we see is just as measurement was the process that we used to link construct A and B, um, to independent variable and construct B to the dependent variable, we're now going to be thinking about measurement validity as the type of validity we're concerned with that it exists along this link. So uh, we think about validity as could go wrong along any of these links. And the one that we're going to be talking about is how things can go wrong if our measurement, the way that our construct is captured in our independent variable, is invalid. So measurement validity has, in essence, really two parts. You've heard the word reliable, but there's also the, the second part. So reliability is a very important. So that means internal consistency, that um, we're constantly getting the thing that we want to measure. But this second idea, the concept of the intended theoretical construct, is, can also be thought about in a systematic way. So we can think about content and face validity, which is where we have to define it carefully. There needs to be expert agreement. We can think about predictive validity. Um, so if we are right that this measure is measuring what we think it's measuring, then it should predict something in the future. Um, also concurrent convergent. Um, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about those. And discriminant just basically means that this measure that we're using is distinct from related concepts and existing measures. So first of all, what we're going to do is start with this basic diagram which says anytime we have a variable, right, whether it be measuring political interest, even a behavioral variable like whether or not you voted, um, income, there's some true score that exists out there in the world, right? Your real level of political interest. And then there's some error term. Now, that error term can come from all sorts of places, right? Uh, you didn't quite read the directions correctly. Right now, you've been really busy at work, so you haven't been paying much newspaper attention to the newspapers lately, so you underrate your level of interest. Um, maybe the way the question is asked sort of led to a bit of confusion. Whatever it is, there's error terms. So the thing that we actually measure, our variable, is going to be this combination of the true score plus the error term, right? So the, the true score is if we hit the bullseye, the error term is what we're picking up for all sorts of various reasons. So the one thing we might want to think about, again, is this idea that measures need to be reliable. They need to, basically, if we measured you over and over again, you, we should be able to get fairly similar results for the same case. So if I came and I asked your political interest this week, I asked you again next week, week after that, on average, we should see that most people are giving the same scores week after week. Again, with a little bit of play, there's going to be some error. But if the error is up one week and down the next week, then we're going to think, OK, we're getting about the same um, score. So let's look at the three ways that we can measure consistency. Um, and these are through looking at the internal reliability, the test retest reliability, and the intercoder reliability. So judging an intercoder reliability is something you're surely familiar with, right? So in ice skating and diving, many people think those things aren't real sports because in essence, the way if you know you put a bunch of people with a stopwatch on the side of a pool. You would know exactly who came in first, who came in second, and most of them would come up with about the same result, like within a few milliseconds or a few seconds. And in fact, we've got, now got this great tech, touch technology, which is supposed to be near perfection, right? Very little error. But when you look at something like ice skating or diving, part of the reason people don't always appreciate um, those as quote unquote true sports is because there is so much variability. So if there's no intercoder reliability, everyone should be giving a six, right? Or a 10 or whatever it is. But in fact, what we tend to see um, in some scores is you'll see something like, well, one person thinks it's a 10, another person thinks it's a 5.5. That is a lot 
of variability. Um, that suggests that that um, that scoring system, for whatever reason, isn't the intercreditor reliability is quite low. Um, and there are actually formal ways we can measure intercreditor reliability, but it becomes quite important, say, with coding text. If you've done any of those research projects, it may be that what has happened is is you've uh, your the researcher you're working for has had two or three of you code the same piece of text, several of them, to see whether or not you were coding it the same way. And if there was if you were different, you know, 30% of the time you gave the same piece of text a different score, then maybe you need to rethink your um, coding system. Test retest reliability is looking, it's very much the same concept and actually mathematically quite similar to intercoder reliability, but here the idea is, is you should be getting exactly, if you go through and you measure the same uh, variable on different tests, so you retest somebody, they should be getting about the same score. Um, one of the things about all the standardized tests you might have taken, the ACT, the SAT, they are designed to have remarkably high test retest reliability. So it shouldn't be the case unless you've studied or done something to actually change um, uh, your preparation for the test, that you get dramatically different scores from one round to another. Um, the test retest abilities on tests in general ranges from about 87% of the people get to up to 98%. These are correlations between the first test you take and the second test you take. Um, when you ask people about brand personality, so you actually go out and you ask people, is this brand friendly? Is this brand um, warm? Is this brand competent? Um, those are actually pretty high too. So 75% of the time, sort of the way that the brand ends up in one survey will be about the same way it ends up in another survey. It's an incorrect, it's actually a 0.75 correlation, but let's just say that places, it's high. It ends up about the same place. As you get down into other things like personality and political attitudes, you start to see these test retests. So the answers people give on one version of the test and the answers they give on next actually go quite low. So it's decent for personality, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, if you're using the big five test. But when you get down to political attitudes, issue attitudes, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 correlation. Party ID, if you use a specific version of it, um, it turns out that the actual, the way we measure party ID, whether we ask people, put yourself on a seven point scale, or if we ask them a branching form of the question, are you a Democrat, Republican, or independent, and then are you a strong or weak Democrat, ends up having a big impact on how stable those political um, party ID is. If you, you ask the person whether they're Republican or Democrat, you ask them their party ID on two different waves of a survey. So you ask them once, you ask them a year later, it matters a lot whether or not you've asked them a branching question. Race and immigration attitudes, we can see are the one exception to most political issue attitudes. And the people do have slightly more stable um, attitudes about um, race and immigration. Now, the thing about consistent measures is we could be getting the same score over and over again, but we're completely missing the bullseye, right? So every single one of those things is in some way um, biased. And right, this has been part of the claim about many of the standardized tests is they might be consistent, but they aren't necessarily measuring what we want to measure, or they are in some way uh, systematically biased away from the answer that we think we should, the, the, from measuring the thing that we think we should be measuring. So they can be consistent, but not necessarily valid. That brings us to the next issue. We need them to be unbiased, which means on average, we need to get the right answer. So these types of validity we'll consider are face and content validity, predictive or concurrent um, validity, and also convergent and discriminant validity. So uh, face validity means basically we all sort of agree that expert agreement is, is that, okay, this, this question on the survey, we think it's measuring X and it seems to be measuring X. Um, one of the things is that it's very difficult to know that on surveys, sometimes you can use things like, what are uh, you thinking about probes following survey questions? We'll talk about that more in the survey week. The other approach is to use criterion related validity. So concurrent predictive um, and um, decision validity. Okay, so basically concurrent validity uh, goes something like this. 
we have a survey, we have self-reported voter turnout. So the proportion of people who say they're voting, 80% um, say they voted and 20% uh, say they didn't vote. But of those people who report voting, we have a record. So we can go and actually check the actual, so we look up their names, we go to the um, place that they're registered, the polling place, and we see whether or not they actually are marked down at the polling place as having voted or not. So this is a validated vote, which it takes place. It's very expensive, but we do it on some political science surveys. Now, as you can see, people are much more likely to over-report voting. The people who say they didn't vote, only 3% of them actually show up as having voted in the records. But some of you might be familiar with some of the research showing the problem that we face is that even this quote unquote gold standard um, criterion of the actual record of voting at the polling place might be misleading. Um, if they mailed in their ballot, it got lost. If somebody went to go vote, but for some reason was later declared ineligible, or they showed up to vote and they were actually sent away from the polling place incorrectly, right? There have been an increasing understanding that there are mistakes made where people might actually go and go through the process of voting and yet be, for some reason, not counted as having count, cast a valid ballot. So you have to be careful that even sometimes this gold standard criterions that we might want to use for actual behavioral evidence trails, right? So sort of empirical evidence trails, to the extent that those are even have a little bit of error in them, um, we can't always use them as a perfect measure for concurrent validity. Still better though than simply relying on self-reports. Um, another way we might want to to check things is so we might be interested and in, say um, the number of mass killings in the US and so one way we might develop a proxy for that is basically whether or not they've appeared in news coverage or not now again this is a, a measure that seems reasonable but you have if you check it for the concurrent validity with the actual number of homicides involving multiple vic multiple victims um, in the Department of Justice data, you see that those types of killings have, in fact, stayed fairly level. So in this case, the measure of massacres in the, in the U.S. based on the New York Times coverage might actually be misleading based on the concurrent validity check of checking against Department of Justice figures. But, again, a caveat, Department of Justice figures might not be the same thing as a massacre. And in fact, some of the optional readings for this week go into this particular problem in more detail and talk a lot about how you go in and measure what would count as a certain type of basically violence that was noteworthy of political coverage. So I'll leave that there, but just this is an example of how one goes about establishing concurrent validity. Um, also sometimes called, uh, or uh, sorry, another way we could do this is um, convergent validity looks very much the same as concurrent validity. The difference is, is that it's, um, w we assume there's not so much of a gold standard the way that there was in the, the behavioral cases of actual statistics that are government recorded. I um, mean, discriminant validity, again, what you're looking for is that there's an empirical discrimination between related constructs, such as poverty and education. They both might be um, measures of something like class, but like having an income below the poverty line might happen even to people with um, higher educations. And so therefore, when you think about class, you could think about sort of educational class and, and income related class as being, um, you can discriminate between them. And there are reasons to think about both aspects of class. So um, an example of a paper that goes through this, um, and I should point out that anytime you see a blue link like this, it means that you can click on it and go to the original article and read it, but is a, an article by Glick and Fisk where they said, okay, there is this type of sexism out there that we think of as hostile sexism. So this is men that are like, say, more likely to abuse their wives or say sort of negative um, demeaning things about women. But Glick and Fisk said there might be another concept called benevolence sexism, which is where one is, for example, uh, believes in being a knight in shining armor and protecting young maidens, which still has a certain amount of sexism inherent to it that, you know, um, uh, 
you know, I think Arya and Brienne, Game of Thrones, right? These are people who don't necessarily um, need protection. Uh, also, one could think, well, you know, you might believe in the idea that men and women have their role and that women are in charge of the home. And so therefore, I'm going to be, in essence, I'm going to treat a woman as an equal, but only in the sphere of the home and that um, in the sphere of the workplace, women don't really belong there. It's not that women are being treated in this demeaning, consistently hostile way, but rather that there's a sphere that women are confined to. So Glick and Fisk go through and do a pretty sophisticated analysis where they can show that the benevolent sexism is clearly discriminated from um, the more traditional hostile sexism, but the three elements that they put into benevolent sexism sort of hang together in a certain way and, are, and converge on the same concept. Um, so again, they use some sophisticated techniques, but it's a good example of the type of measurement analysis that I should point out is quite common in psychology. Unfortunately, it has historically been less so in political science, but interest in measurement and measurement analysis is increasingly common and is starting to become published more and more often. In most scientific journals, you'll find that measurement-related articles take up probably 50% or more of the space. And even in psychology, you find an exceptionally large number of articles related to measurement. And in political science, there's a growing interest in publishing work that isn't necessarily purely about proving a new theory or, or providing evidence on a new hypothesis, but that it's actually about the measurement process itself. So, we now have shown that liable and valid measures need to be biased, but suppose they're quite noisy. Suppose that our error is un, um, unbiased, right? So, sometimes you hit to the left of the target, sometimes you hit the right, but you still can't hit the bullseye. And we're trying to get it as close to the bullseye as possible. At least we know that the person shooting these arrows right has a bow that is not consistently shooting to the right, but it's unbiased, but it's not that accurate. So we need something to be a little bit more accurate. And that is the third uh, desired criteria for a good measure, is it's going to be precise or low at error, i.e. it's going to be quite close to the right answer. So, um, one of the things to keep in mind is that, in a, in a good example actually of a measurement related paper, is that it turns out some the response format itself, particularly on um, online surveys, can have a pretty big impact on the degree of measurement error. Uh, if people found it very difficult um, to use a type A response where every single option is labeled, they also had some issues potentially with um, where the endpoints are labeled, but the midpoints are not in some way labeled. On the type C's, people uh, got confused sometimes. Actually, I think these this, this graph seems to be incorrect. But basically, people like it when their numbers go up. They also often like a midpoint labeled. So all of these little details, um, which we'll be talking about more as you start to work on your group projects. In particular, I'll go through and check you and try to help you understand these details. But in essence, these little response formats can have a big impact on measurement error because people find certain things easier to understand and interpret. So you have to be careful with response format. So when you get through and you find a measure that is gives you consistently the same answer, the answer that is unbiased using some different checks, but also is low variance, i.e. Uh, you seem to be hitting the true error overall, then you feel like you've got a reliable and valid measure. And that is it for this mini lecture.